So in this recording, I'm going to talk to you about stuff from the textbook. And remember, I won't summarise the text for you, but I will draw out some things for you to think about. And like the last recording, this recording might contain some shocks. The next question is... You're full of questions. So the first step in your planning for the interview is to read chapter one of our prescribed text. And when you read it, you might say to yourself, well, this isn't helping me plan my interview, but it is. It is absolutely key. And the key is that from, is that from this chapter, you'll get your first full sight of this thing we call big Q qualitative methods. And you'll see it contrasted both with small Q qualitative methods and with quantitative methods. The thing that's important to get your head round is that the material that we're using for our interviewing and the analysis, the approach we're taking, belongs to big Q qualitative methods. That The hint is in the little logo that I've made. It's big Q. We're using big Q qualitative methods. And big Q qualitative methods is different. And I mean very, very different to the quantitative methods you're likely to have been using up to this point in your training in psychology. And I mean, it's very, very different because it's grounded in a completely different approach to science. And that means you'll need to learn a new language, a new set of behavioral norms and so on. In the textbook, they describe this as a type of cultural shift, which is a really good way of describing it because when you learn about big Q qualitative methods, you're likely to experience something akin to culture shock. This interview is over. You could feel unsettled, confused, disorientated. And if you feel those things, it could be a sign that you're experiencing that type of culture shock. So be reassured by those bad feelings if you have those feelings. If you don't feel unsettled and confused, it might be because you're just natural to big Q qualitative research and it fits you like a glove. But it could also be a sign that you aren't getting it or that you have shifted into small Q qualitative rather than big Q qualitative. Because small Q qualitative, if you do that, take that approach, you don't really have to change the way you're thinking about research at all. You can still think in the way that you were when you were learning about quantitative research. But we had the option to do small Q qualitative. So why the heck didn't we do that if it would have been easier on you? I am certain I fulfill the requisite quantitative and qualitative criteria. Well, we're here to challenge you because this is a level three unit, which means this knowledge is ready for you to take into a professional setting or to take into a postgraduate course if you want to study further. So we need to challenge you. But it's also because big Q is, in my view, more useful. And because it's so different to quantitative methods, it will give you breadth to your understanding of what research is and what science is more broadly. And because it's so different from quantitative research, it will give you a new perspective on things. Now, the first part of the culture shock is the need to engage positively with subjectivity. In big Q qualitative research, subjectivity is a good thing, not a bad thing. So let me start with that. He is not human, he's a robot. Now, I can't start with your subjectivity, because I don't know, know you that well, or know you at all. So uh, I will start with mine. Now I began using big Q qualitative methods back in 1992. Yes, I know, I'm old. Back in 1992, when I started doing my psychology honors project. Back in those days, qualitative methods in general in psychology, and I mean big Q as well as small Q, was not well established at all. And it was commonly looked down on by many people in psychology, something that wasn't sufficiently scientific. But I just didn't feel that quantitative methods were applicable to the work I was doing. I was working with people who were labelled as intellectually impaired. And there were two reasons why I didn't feel quantitative methods made much sense for my work. First, I was working collaboratively with people, working as an advocate, working in partnership and working to assist people to successfully move from institutional care to community care. This was work I was doing in the voluntary sector rather than in my role as a psychology student. 
that the language of experimental research design and statistical analysis was just alien to the people I was working with. In fact, it was a barrier to them and it made them feel stupid and disempowered. Second, these were people whose life chances had been severely restricted because of their numerical scores on various quantitative assessment tools, such as IQ tests. And that was utterly unjust because those quantitative tools were so crude they could tell us nothing about the person's life. IQ tests and the like get us nowhere near to understanding the complexity of the lives of the people who are given these scores. An IQ score could tell you nothing about a person's life experiences, their hopes, their dreams, their talents and so on. So quantitative research had contributed to these people's alienation from their community and even from their own families. When did you know that he was abnormal or subnormal? Oh, it would have been nearly three when we found out that... Uh, and we went to this man and he just looked in his eyes and said, yes, he's mentally deficient. They have no future, either of them, of course. They're just going to live out as long as they've got in the asylum. But uh, this, of course, is just in this world and we know that they're quite sinless and pure. That they'll go straight to heaven when they die. What I wanted to do was to look at the experiences of community, of, of community care, of people labelled as intellectually impaired. I wanted to hear people's stories. I went to a form that was locked ward and there's a big yard and you lay in the yard, come in inside and you're doped up with medicine and you go out again and I was laying on the Laying in the bed, and the doctor asked me a few questions. Do I hear voices? And I said, No, I don't hear voices. I said, I just wanted to run to me, to me mum. The next, the next day, I had to have shock treatment. I had seven shock treatments, and they didn't even ask me, um, you know, if I wanted it or. or Demonstrations like this heralded a new era of change. People began moving out of the institutions to live in the community. Big Q qualitative methods was really the only thing I could use and I've been hooked on Big Q qualitative methods ever since. Uh, I, after I did my honours project, I went to do my PhD, I um, then used qualitative methods in work with the UK government to inform the construction of the disability anti-discrimination legislation. Um, I worked with employers to, using qualitative methods, I worked with employers to remove barriers faced by disabled people seeking employment by hearing disabled people's view, experiences of applying for work. And most recently, I've been working with people with a diagnosis of mental illness and been challenging some of the bad practices in our psychiatric institutions, our psychology clinics, and some of the bad practices of the psychopharmaceutical industry. Now, that's too long a story. That's a truncated version of my life. Because um, <laughs> my, my work goes on for about the last 27 years, so it's too long to tell you all about that stuff. But I tell, I'll, I'll sum it up. I'll sum it up. I'll sum up why I use Big Q qualitative methods with just two concluding points. Point one, Big Q allows me to capture a more honest picture of the messy, contingent, complicated reality of people's lives. I don't know if you've noticed, but people's lives are complex. And point two, Big Q qualitative methods allows us to engage fully with people's stories, to hear those stories, to tell those stories, and to use those stories to promote social change. So, there you go. Why was it important for me to tell you a bit about my life story? Well, it's because the experiences I've had, the views I've formed, and the values I've aligned to all shape the work I do and how I make sense of things. 
And that's what subjectivity is all about. And subjectivity is important for qualitative research. Now, to fully explain this, I need to talk about some scary stuff. I need to talk to you about the ologies, ontology, epistemology, and methodology. Now, in the video where I talked about using the textbook, how to approach the textbook, I said we'd do this in week one, but I'm going to push that back into week two because you're going to get more support from the textbook in week two on this stuff. Chapter two contains the stuff on ontology, epistemology and stuff. What I want to do in my next video is talk to you a little bit more about subjectivity and then I'll talk to you about the theologies in week two. So, till then, ta-da.